Amen. Uh, Rick, next, the next slide. This is a picture uh, that you see here. This is uh, a statue outside of San Diego, California. Uh, of course, you can tell that that's a picture of what people would say Jesus would look like. But notice uh, there are no hands. Vandals actually took the hands off of that particular statue. And uh, there is a plaque that's underneath of it that says, I have no hands but yours. I have no hands but yours. And quite frankly, friends, that is the, is the launching point for utilizing our spiritual gifts. Jesus has no hands but ours. He left us here to serve, to work, and to, and to uh, use the gifts that he's given us. And the truth that we find is in, in Romans chapter 12, when Jesus was here on earth, he ministered in a physical body. Um, but he's returned to heaven, so he has, he's now ministering through a spiritual body. By the way, the body of Christ is that spiritual body, the church. Amen? Amen. And so we see that today. We are the body of Christ. And it is our responsibility, friends, to be the hands of Christ. Now... Verse 5, as we read in the scripture today, verse 5 talks about members. The word members there means body parts. You see, he has no hands but ours. He has no feet but ours. He has no voice but ours. Do you understand that? We are his representatives here on this earth. And our first obligation to the Lord Jesus Christ is to surrender. We don't like to surrender. Anybody ever uh, play Monopoly? Anybody ever play Monopoly? How many of y'all are pretty good at Monopoly? My future son-in-law is pretty good at Monopoly. He's pretty ruthless, as a matter of fact. So I have to up my game a little. I let him win a few. You know how you know? You know how pool sharks do? They let you get the the big head first. Um, so <clears throat> he has this on. Uh, on a TV uh, with a game. Switch. A what? Nintendo Switch. Okay, that. He's got a thing called a Switch. I don't know. All it is is a game system. You hold the thing, you roll the dice with this button and whatever. So, so it's interesting. So, I was, he and I were playing and, and a couple others and we were watching, we were playing it on the big TV there and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I landed on one of his spaces that had a hotel. Yikes! I didn't have any money. I knew I was going to go bankrupt, but I refused to go down without a fight. I mortgaged every property I had. He says, are you kidding me? Because if you go bankrupt in that game, all your properties go to that person. <laughs> I said, I said, here's your money. He says, but you only have one unmortgaged property left. Yes, I have a chance. I was not going to surrender that easily. Amen? But you know, aren't we that way as Christians, though? When it comes to the will of God, we hold on for dear life before we give God everything that we are. Now, in Monopoly, I just, I just did it just to mess with my future son-in-law because that's what a father-in-law does. <laughs> But when it comes to the surrender to, the, to God himself, friends, when we decide not to do that, we're the ones that miss out. Total obligation, complete surrender. And that's why in verses 1 and 2, they're attached to verses 3 through 8. And, and uh, if you were to read verses 1 and 2, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be, that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. God cannot use us in the body of Christ until we surrender complete control of our gifts to Him. Now, here's some things that this involves. It involves, first, total dedication. Total dedication. Complete surrender means total dedication. I'm not talking about 98%. I'm not talking about 
percent. Somebody did that. It was a it was a soap commercial or something. Ninety nine point eight percent pure. And it made me wonder what was that other two tenths of a percent. <laughs> you ever wonder that? For years, for years, when I was working in the science lab, I would I, I often wondered if I could break that down and find I could have. But my boss wouldn't have liked that very much, so I kept busy on what he asked me to do. Friends, in verse 1, we see language of the Old Testament priesthood. The, the priest would make what was called a drink offering, and they would make a certain mixture and pour it upon the altar. And that is what we are to do with our life. We are to lay our life on the altar. The drink offering was saying, I give you everything. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to lay our life on the altar and say, Dear God, everything is yours. But it also, uh, not only is total dedication, but radical separation. You see what I mean by radical? You see, verse 2, it says, tells us we don't need to allow our life uh, to be poured into the world's mold. Our goal is not to be a weirdo. Um, it's, it's just not to be like the world. You know, there's a lot of folks that will look and say, you're just a nut. You're crazy. You're this. You're that. Thank you very much. I'm having the right impact. Somebody says, well, what do you mean? Here's the thing. Uh, let, me, let me kind of give you an example. On Tuesdays, the second Tuesday or first Tuesday, what's River Rockers? Second Tuesday? Second Tuesday. On the second Tuesday of every month, we have River Rockers. And that is a group of 50 and older folks that get together. I want to tell you something, friends. I have more fun at that group than I would at any local bar. Amen? Amen. Some of you may not agree, but that's okay. I want to tell you something, friends. We have a good time there. And uh, boy, it's spirited in the competition, I'll tell you that. And people call names and everything else. It's crazy. But they're nice names. Yeah. I would rather hang around a group of godly people than anybody else in the world. Amen. I really would. Friends, we need to be a separated believer. We need to live differently, by the way, and think differently than the world does today. The problem in the church today is too many in the church, pastors included, think too much like the world. And they're allowing too much of the world in. There is no clear delineation between the church and the world. Not to be higher than thou, mightier than thou, look down our nose at them, but for them to know there's a difference when you live a life for Christ. Does the world know by the way you live that you are a child of God? Friends, the media refers to us as a radical right wing. And they don't mean it as a compliment. But I sure take it that way. You want to know why? That means that they're being impacted. You say, Brother Don, are you trying to be offensive? No. I'm trying to live for God. And when I live for God, and when you live for God, our light will shine in the world. Darkness does not like light. And when you see people reacting as they do to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll know you're living in the right direction. Do you understand that? Well, here's the third thing, <clears throat> is that we need to have an inner transformation. Salvation begins as an inside job. Do you know that? Salvation's an inside job. Too many times we try to gussy up the outside. Amen? You gotta look right, you gotta dress right, you gotta cut your hair right, you gotta smell right. Well, we really appreciate it if you did smell okay. Um, you gotta, you know what I'm saying? Too many times man places restrictions that God has never placed. Now I'm here to tell you if you're a lady in this auditorium today and you have on makeup and you have cut your hair within the last hundred years. And you have uh, uh, no dress or skirt on, or if your skirt only goes uh, to between the knee and the ankle, you would not be allowed in certain churches. Correct. Did you know that? Yep. <coughs> and I ask 
you, where in Scripture does it say that? Amen. Where does it say that? Jesus says, come as you are and let me change you from the inside out. Amen. Too many times we try to gussy up the outside and the inside just as rotten as ever. Let Jesus do His work. Friends, your appearance won't be one that will glorify God and draw others to Him until there's a change beneath the surface. Friends, your spirit will show far greater than your clothing or any the way you dress. There needs to be that inner transformation. Well, all three of the above are summed up by complete surrender. Friends, it will do us no good at all to deal with spiritual gifts, to think about what our gifts are until we have grappled with the issue of complete surrender. Now, because surrender and service always go together. Surrender and service always go together. You can't separate the two. Friends, we, have, we all have spiritual gifts given to us at salvation. Now, some of us get spiritual gifts more than others. But that doesn't mean that we're to say, look at me. I can do more than you. <laughs> and somebody says that to me and say, yeah, but not as good as I can do what I do. <laughs> So the thing is, hey, listen, you want to, don't brag about it. We'll get into that in just a minute. The point is not how many you have, but are you using them for Christ? Are you using them? Well, after verses 1 and 2, there's six verses about spiritual gifts. And the, the passage uh, that we read destroys the idea that a Christian can be committed to Christ but not active in church. That they can love the Lord but not obey Him. You see, that blows the whole narrative. People tell me all the time, I worship God in nature. <laughs> I said, okay. When did you go to church? Well, I don't go to church. Well, are you saved? I'm a Christian. You didn't answer my question. 80 plus percent of the United States claims to be Christian. I'm saying, are you born again? Are you saved? And I want to tell you something. If you are truly saved, you'll want to utilize your gifts for Christ. Because we're changed from the inside out. And so my question is, are you using your spiritual gifts? You say, Brother Don, are you saying that people can't just go out in nature to appreciate nature and worship God? No, I'm not saying that. But to do that to the neglect of the command to not forsake the assembling together of them that love the Lord. In other words, to forsake going to church instead of... Or, and then instead going to the, to the woods. That's different. There's people say, I love the Lord. But are you obeying Him? Well, yeah. No, 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 no. You don't mean, you, you not, you not listen to what I'm saying. Total surrender of everything. Total. These spiritual, these spiritual gifts will go fly in the face of those that say, I can, I can live the way I want and still love the Lord. No, you can't. Friends, our obligation is the same. To be faithful to use our gifts for the glory of the one who gave them to us. Friends, every man in verse 3, all members, verse 4, everyone, verse 5, he makes it abundantly clear we're under the same obligation. No one is excluded from serving God. No one. We're all apart. And one more thing before we look at these gifts specifically. The importance of humility. Humility. We have lost all sense of humility in this country. Friends, there's a temptation to take pride in our gifts and compare them with the gifts of others. We've got to resist that. 
But we've got to humbly seek out our gifts. Be humble, my friends. Be humble. True humility will help us to avoid several things. Number one, it'll help you to avoid magnifying your gift. You see, <clears throat> you feel valuable, indispensable, you deserve special recognition, my opinion matters most. Friends, that kind of person uh, feels like they don't need the other parts of the body. You ever met somebody that said, especially at the workplace or something, they just, <laughs> I don't know why they have anybody. I am the, I am the woman. I am the man. I am it. Right? I've run into people that way. They're not it. <laughs> I'll guarantee you that. There's a parallel passage in 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 20. It says, But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble, uh, <clears throat> more feeble uh, are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon, the, upon these, we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempted the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which is lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. I want to ask you a question. How many of you today have thanked God for your pancreas? <laughs> yeah. Lord, thank you for my pancreas. <laughs> Friends, you may not think much of it, but if it quits, you're in trouble. Anybody ever been sick? You try to eat? The whole body participates in the effort. And I mean, you got your brain saying, oh, that's good food, or ooh, that's nasty. You have the tongue and the teeth and the mouth. The heart says, woohoo, nourishment, here it comes. Your whole body rejoices at the fact that you're eating. <laughs> I'm not sure what they rejoice at mine when I eat, but other than that, they stop. All right, anyway. <laughs> Finally, the food will hit your stomach, which is to digest the food. But it says, you know, not today. I'm taking the day off. So up it all comes back. Amen? Here's the thing. Don't magnify your gift. God's going to raise up somebody else with the same gift, but without pride. See, our body parts can't take days off. When they do, we have to go to the doctor. The doctor charges you a lot of money and says, <laughs> it's just a viral thing. <laughs> Friends, we need each other. Don't magnify your gift. Have you ever thought about what it would be like if the members of our physical bodies behave like the members of our spiritual body sometimes? I thought about that. I know I'm weird. But hang on with me, okay? Here we go. What about your heart? Your heart says, you know what? I am really stuck in a rut. I don't think the other organs realize they couldn't do their jobs without me. I'm tired of it. It's time for somebody else to step up. Okay, feet, you pump bud for a while. Isn't that like some Christians, right? I'm in a rut. It's time for time to pass the torch. In other words, that's an excuse to quit. How about the lungs? <laughs> the lungs say we are so underappreciated here. I don't think the other organs realize that they couldn't do their job without us. If we quit doing our job for a few minutes, everyone will finally see how valuable we are to this place. The brain thinks he's big stuff. <laughs> Let him do without some oxygen for a while. We'll see how important he is. <laughs> Anybody ever met somebody like that before? Whether at work or at church? Absolutely. Oh, here's another one. What about your liver? <laughs> hey, hang with me. Why do I get all the dirty work? <laughs> you think it's fun making bile? I've been in this body for 50 years. 
And do you think anyone has ever asked me to make any decisions, pump any blood, perform any functions that are noticeable outside the body? Sometimes I wonder why I even bother. You ever hear somebody like that? Yeah. Or the appendix. <laughs> just, just watch all those organs. Watch them do all the work. Day after day, hour after hour, they work themselves to death. I'm just along for the ride. Why should I contribute when I can just sit here and get the same nutrients and oxygen that they get? Why get involved? Now, friends, there's no unimportant parts of your body, except maybe the appendix. Don't be an appendix in your church, amen? <laughs> body parts for a sermon illustration, man. Don't maximize your gift, but also don't minimize your gift. Friends, this is the person that constantly belittles themselves, which is false humility. False humility is a form of pride. Some people do this because uh, they're fishing for compliments. As a <laughs> pastor told me one time, he said, uh, after church, he said, uh, Honey, how many truly great preachers do you think there are in this world? She said, Probably one less than you think. <laughs> yes! What a help me, amen? <laughs> Friends, some people minimize their gift to get out of using it. And some genuinely think they cannot be used. Is that you today? You may be the big toe in the body of Christ. You may not be the pretty eyes or the lovely voice or the flowing gray hair. But we need you. Do you realize without your big toes, your equilibrium would be off and the whole body would be out of balance? I like to think I'm a big toe. Yeah. Some people think that your gift is not as public as others are. Maybe there's somebody on the platform, maybe behind the scenes, but friends, don't minimize the importance of it. Because to minimize the importance of the gift that God has given you, whether behind the scenes or out in front, is to minimize what God has done and wants to do in your life. <laughs> How about this? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> anybody ever had menial tasks that they've ever done at church? Yeah, like cleaning the baptistry or changing the sign or janitorial stuff, you know, all that. You ever get a bad attitude sometimes about that? Call it a stinking thinking. You ever get stinking thinking? <clears throat> I'm a big toe, I can say that. <laughs> Do you need a checkup from your neck up? That's another one. That's a good one there. What about this? You do these menial tasks, but people criticize you all the time for it. Has anybody ever listen? Here's the thing. When you talk to people, it's sometimes the first thing out of their mouth always a criticism about you or somebody else. And you stop and you think, why? What is the purpose? Maybe on the outside, you, you know, when you answer the criticism, you say, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I know. But on the inside, you tell them to shut up and do it yourself. <laughs> Anybody ever been that way? <laughs> I'm sure we have. But then you hear how blessed somebody was, maybe by the sign. Right. Then you hear maybe how somebody was blessed by the cleanliness of the, of the, of the facility. I want to tell you something. When... Uh, I, I, I forgot to tell you, when uh, we had the, the uh, revival crusade and Grace Baptist was here, one of the first things that came out of several of their mouths, they said, I have never seen a building so clean in my life. Yeah. Bathrooms and all. And I'm like, blah, 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 what? <laughs> Praise God! I want to tell you something. You don't clean that baptismal, you can be slip sliding away on the floor. All that slimy stuff will hit there. And we have folks to clean the baptismal faithfully. Flowers. You walk in and say, wow, another magical appearance of flowers. But that's a behind the scenes something that somebody ministers to you through their 
gift or talent in, in giving and in, in arranging flowers. Amen. Amen. You hear somebody gets a blessing out of it. And then you humbly say, little is much when God is in it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Friends, and although you feel unappreciated, a clean restroom will keep visitors returning until they get saved. So don't magnify, don't minimize. Thirdly, humility will keep us from misplacing our gift. You ready for this? This person tries to be used in, the, in an area in which they're not gifted. They want to sing or teach and feel they have the gift, but no one has the gift of listening to them. <laughs> Jealousy tends to be the root of that one. People want a more public gift than they have. As music directors around, they've, there's music directors that have had people to threaten to leave the church. I have people threaten to leave the church if I didn't give them a more public uh, ministry to have. They say, well, if I can't do here, I'll have to go somewhere else to use my gift. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> on the outside, I'm saying, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. You have to do as the Lord uh, leads you. Right? On the inside, I say, don't let the door hit. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> some will accidentally misplace their gift. They were asked to help. They were willing. They got the job, but they end up frustrated if they're not supposed to be there. You're going to be the happiest and, and do the best when you're in the right area. Amen. True humility keeps us from magnifying, minimizing, misplacing our gift. And in verse 3, the word soberly means sane. The opposite of insane. There's a man that visited an insane asylum. There's a hundred inmates and one guard. The visitor asks the guard, aren't you afraid they'll get together to overtake you? The guy says, no. Why not? He said, because lunatics never get together. <laughs> they don't. And that's a lot of churches today. Oh, what we could do if we were all pulling together for Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, we all need to focus clearly on who we are and why God left us here. We also need to know what our gifts are. Now, um, here's another thing, too. On uh, Wednesday nights, uh, for the next few Wednesday nights, and then we're going to take a break, while Terry is uh, teaching on Wednesday nights, um, share Jesus without fear. That starts the second or the fourteenth of of what? We're going to start on Valentine's Day. What a perfect day to start! Anyway, the fourteenth Wednesday night, uh, share Jesus without fear. But until then, we're going to go over some spiritual gifts. So we're also going to find out um, about gift projection. That happens when you expect other people to have your gift, to do things as you do them, to feel the same way you do about a subject, and with the same passion. Got a word for you. It's not going to happen. Uh, I thought I left my spiritual gifts assessments underneath this little table here, but apparently they're in my office or somewhere. So I'm going to ask... Oh, my wife would be glad to go get them. Thank you. She raised her hand. She volunteered. Such a sweet wife. And here's what's going to happen, okay? I have always, not always, but I have many times, I, hate, I, I try not to use the word always. Many times I say that every, every member needs to be a minister. Every one of us needs to be a minister for Christ. Whether you're a member of this church uh, or you're saved and you're thinking about being a member, you should be a member of this church. If God has brought you here, it's here for to be a member of this church. But I want all of our members specifically to fill this out. Now, on Wednesday night, I've already handed some out. Uh, if you are here this past Wednesday night. And what I want you to do is fill out this spiritual gifts assessment. What this does is gives you an idea or points you in a direction of where um, you might be spiritually gifted. It's just a series of 80 questions. It goes uh, from one to five. One is most like you and five is not or reverse. One end of it is, boy, that's me all the time. The other end is, no, that's not me all the time. <laughs> that's not me at all. Um, try not to put a three. But here's the reason we're doing this, okay? First, I want everybody to know what their spiritual gifts are. 
We talk about them all the time. But I want you to know what your spiritual gifts are. Second, I want you to be able to see visually that you have a place in this church. Every one of us has a place in this church. Thank you, my sweet, sweet, dear wife. They were in my office. Of course they were. I had to hide them because somebody else would have hidden them from me. I'm not going to say who that might be. Um, these are pretty self-explanatory, so you can fill, you'll fill them out. Uh, and I want you to turn these in by next Sunday. So next Sunday, um, if you're here, you bring them. You say, what if I don't? Um, well, then I have somebody to track you down and find out why you did <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, Terry volunteered. There you go. Uh, no, it's important, okay? If we're a member of this church, it is, it is vital we find out where we're gifted, but it's also vital to find out where we belong in this church. To be a part of the body of this church. You say, Brother Don, why are you doing this? Because I believe God has greater things for this church. I believe that if we will focus and, and just obey God and we will do what He asks us to do, we're going to grow numerically. I believe we're going to double in attendance this year. I believe we're going to go from 100 to 200 average. You say, Brother Don, I don't know if we're going to... You've already defeated it. I believe Sunday school, we're going we're gonna, to uh, double or triple our attendance in Sunday school. Where are we going to put them all in Sunday school? I don't know. Be like the ladies. We'll just, we'll just tack them to the wall. Amen? <laughs> put little stair steps. Y'all can just sit on your little thrones up there. Let, you know. <laughs> I believe God's going to allow us to do some things here that will astound. All of us. I believe we're going to triple the number of baptisms this year. I believe we're going to triple or quadruple the number of salvations this year. You say, Brother Don, why do you believe that? Because I believe that God has brought this special group of people together for a reason. And it's high time we know what that reason is. And it's high time that we get busy about the business of Christ. Because I'm here to tell you, our time is short. Jesus is coming again, friends, and He's coming soon. As I close, the very first gift that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to give to you today is the gift of salvation.